President Shakasvili, former president of Georgia. He was leader of Georgia from 2004 to 2013. Recently, he was appointed by Ukrainian President Poroshenko to serve as chairman of the International Advisory Council on Reforms of the President of Ukraine. Uh, president Shakasvili. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Johnson. Thank you, Senator Shaheen. Thank you, Senator Gardner, for this wonderful initiative. Um, I want to thank you, the committee and subcommittee, uh, for the in invitation. Uh, perhaps it is a little un unorthodox to find a former uh, president uh, representing the interests of another nation before the United Nations Senate. But I think the distinguished members of this committee understand why I have gone from being president of one nation for, to helping the president of another. Ukraine and Georgia are on front lines of a fight that may seem far away, but it's the very much the fi fight that the American people and certainly U.S. Congress understands more than anybody else in the world. This is not fight about territory, about railway junctures, this or that town. This is fight about principles, ideals, way of life. This is fight whether we can escape from this curse of Soviet corrupt cronies uh, inefficient societies to being efficient democracies based on rule of law. Uh, Ukraine, and here is the story of a Budapest memorandum, which I have to remind the members of the committee. Ukraine gave up 1,800 warheads, one third of the Soviet nuclear arsenal to help secure peace in post-Cold War Europe. That was on the insistence of the United States the United States, among other big powers, were guarantors of Ukraine's territorial integrity and sovereignty and their statehood based on, the, uh, based on the Ukraine giving up the weapons. Even more than that, on insistence of this country and other great powers, Ukraine has diminished its defense capabilities from having almost one million people serving in the military to, uh, down to 120,000. Um, Ukraine has utilized uh, the 120,000 tons of ammunition and mines. Um, they've uh, uh, incapacitated 6,000 tanks for the last decades, and that was the time when they were complying with their, all their treaty obligations uh, while Russia was building up their military potential and propping up their muscles. And now here we are. Ukraine has given all this up, hoping that they will be guaranteed peaceful future. Certainly they were not willing to attack or planning to attack anybody. And in, instead of giving up several thousand nuclear warheads, they are asking basically for several thousand anti-tank missiles to defend themselves and to check Russian tanks and advancing deep into their territory, as well as some other weapons. The, and this is certainly supporting Ukraine at this moment means, first of all, besides all the other support, also giving them means to defend that democracy. And in order and to support them being, build a viable, strong Ukrainian democracy. And I think it's now imperative of the US security and the world security. The road markers of Putin's reign are the gravestones of his critics and opponents. Every marker we can think of in this timeline is about increasing control of Russia, of the Russian speaking world. In September, 1999, as director of FSB, Putin sent troops into Chechnya. Three months later, he was acting president of Russia. In August 2008, he invaded my country, Georgia. Three months later, the constitution has changed to assure that when Putin returned to the presidency, it would be a six-year term. Putin's military excursions are always the prelude to the centralization of his personal power. This has made Russia more unpredictable and Europe and the United States less secure. One year ago, as the corrupt regime of Yanukovych fell, Russian forces moved into Crimea, then East Ukraine, then there was downing of passenger jet, as you rightly pointed, pointed out, Senator. Uh, in September last year, President Poroshenko addressed the joint session of the Congress, and we are very grateful for this opportunity. And he also asked for Ukraine that Ukraine requires defensive assistance, because if not given that, Russia will continue to establish facts on the ground that will give them a uh, str stronger position in the kabuki of future negotiations and basically, basically in the killing of Ukraine democracy. I think what Russia is after is uh, seizing the whole southern flank of Ukraine, seizing most of the east, and then going after the government in Kiev and killing the very idea of Ukraine democracy. After the war in 2008 
a de facto ban on arms sales to Georgia was in place, as then opponents saying that providing Ukraine with little weapons will provoke Russia to escalate this conflict. But this appeasement ignores that Putin's aim is to destabilize Ukrainian democracy. Adequate forces can stop aggression. In 1980s, shoulder-shoulder fired Stinger missiles raised the cost of the Soviets in Afghanistan. That was the most decisive factor in the eventual defeat of the Soviet army. That's why it's very important that while there is a, also Europeans who are doing the negotiations, the United States should do the, take the lead empowering regional actors like Poland and joining with forces with supportive nations like the UK and the Bolts to create a coalition to help to arm and train the Ukrainian army. Ukraine must reform. I have focused on that case for arming Ukraine because without this there won't be a country to rebuild. But its success will equally be determined by fighting corruption, bringing the economy out of shadows, increasing revenues to the state budget, and delivering better lives to the people of Ukraine. American support of all these efforts for the Ukraine economy is critical, but time is short, and underneath the deception and deformation war, the Russian plan is clear. They will seize more of the Ukraine, as I said, they will depose the government in Kiev, if not checked in time. Only the swift and immediate action of the U.S. government to train and equip the Ukrainians can stop Putin's strategy to deconstruct the transatlantic architecture, to deconstruct the post-Cold War order. America and the free world has won Second World War, more, and won, Americans won the First World War, and they won the Cold War. What we are seeing is a dramatic situation when all these gains might be reversed. Georgia is a small country, but when we were invaded in 2008, after the failed deal with the Europeans, that was the United, it took the United States and also many members of this very Congress to stop them, also by menacing to take, to, 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 by starting the humanitarian military operation. We didn't involve sending U.S. boots on the ground, but certainly involved sending strong signals to the Russians that they should stop. This war is much more complex than just war on the ground. This is a propaganda war. It is about controlling minds. And it, this war we have yet to begin to fight back to empower the Russian people to look at their own country and their own region and to prevent, prevent the encroachment of the Russian narrative into our politics and media. It was not just NATO army that stopped the spread of communism. It was a collection of strong ideals with an army standing behind it. America, the origin of many of these ideals, was always further away from the front and thus more able to resist the seeming appeal of realist moral compromise. The same must be true today. A democratic, secure Ukraine is the last nation between the revanchist Russia and America and overall the free world. Thank you, Senator, for hearing my testimony. Thank you, Mr.